Central Church, living the gospel of Jesus Christ, being God's love with our neighbors in all places. Central is a place to learn and grow. For children. For youth. And yes, even for adults. Central Church, across from the Cider Mill in Endicott, serving around the world. of Central taking on the designation which many other United Methodist churches have done, taking on the designation of reconciling congregations. Those are congregations who support the full inclusion of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community in the full life of the church. And then much, a little, a little further down the way, Saturday, August 23rd, <coughs> From 3 to 7 p.m. is going to be our annual carnival in the parking lot of the church. There'll be food, fun, and games, and three different musical groups providing live music during the afternoon. We also could use some uh, workers to help make this event happen, so if you haven't signed up yet, we invite you please to do so. I believe there are sign-up sheets outside the office, or you can talk to Kelly Devine directly. There are many other activities noted in your bulletin insert, and I invite you to look those through and, and respond to the ones where you feel called to participate. We'll turn now to our first scripture reading of the morning. The first scripture reading is from Genesis 37, 1 through 4, and 12 through 28. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan, this is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Billa and Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children because he was the son of his old age and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent them from the valley of Hebron. He came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields. The man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers. He said, Tell me, please, where they are pasturing their flock. The man said, they have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dotham. Then so Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father." So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty, there was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels carrying gum, balm, and rosin on their way to carry it down to Egypt. 
Then Judas said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. Let us turn now to the unison prayer that is printed in our bulletin. Let us pray together. Holy One, you catch us unaware from burning bushes, majestic sunrises, gentle streams, vivid dreams, hopeless days, and hurried meals, you invite us to know you and to hear your voice. You visit us in so many ways. Your presence can transform even the most ordinary into holy ground. Yet we are blind to you, for we expect you only in ways that fit our conceptions. We are filled with excuses and self-doubts when action is called for. Remind us again that we are not alone, that in our weakness is your strength, and that in your call is our joy. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. kind of like a spider web, doesn't it? A little bit, maybe, right here in the middle, right? Yeah. Yeah, and it has feathers in it and beads, right? This is called, huh? yep, yep, it sure does. This is called a dream catcher. What's a dream catcher? What's a dream catcher, she asks, giving me the perfect opening. A dream catcher. There is a story about a dream catcher that when we dream, do you, do you have dreams at night sometimes? Yeah. Yeah? You have dreams? I got bad dreams. Some people have bad dreams. Some people have good dreams, right? Yeah. Well, we all do. So a dream catcher, there's this story about it that when dreams come to us. It looks like a spider web. 
spider web. It does look like a spider web. It kind of does the same thing too. The story is that when we have bad dreams, that when we have bad dreams, they get caught in here because you hang it over your bed. And so the bad dreams get caught so they can't go out in the world. But the good dreams get to go through the holes. The good dreams fly through and all our good dreams can go out in the world. Isn't that a cool thing? Wouldn't that be nice if all our wonderful dreams went out into the world and all our bad dreams got stuck in one place and didn't go anywhere? Wouldn't that be great? I wish I had Huh? I know. Well, you know, so do I. I borrowed this one so I could tell you this story. And I'm telling you this story because, did you hear when she was reading the scripture? You may not have. There was a story there about a little brother. Do you know anything about little brothers? Maybe? A little bit? Yeah, kind of. Who has a little brother? Yeah. Lots of people have little brothers. You know what I mean when I say little brother, right? Right? So there was a little brother who had dreams, and his dreams were mostly about being the boss of his big brothers, and they didn't like that very much. It looks like a spider web. It still looks like a spider web, doesn't it? <coughs> well, the story in the Bible today was about the good dreams getting out in the world and the bad dreams getting stuck, which I wanted to share with you today because I think these are very neat too, don't you? Yeah, I kind of wish I had one. Are you going off to visit someone else, Mr. Scott? Okay, then. That was pretty much all I wanted to share with you this morning. Apparently, my time is done. <laughs> so can we have a little prayer before you go back to your grown-ups and before you go back with Miss Sarah? Maybe a little prayer? That'd be all right with you guys? Okay, let's pray. Let's pray, sweetie. Gracious God, we thank you for today, and we thank you for good dreams, and we thank you for bad dreams that don't get too far. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming up. Okay. Can we pray together? Holy One, we come in silence because this world is loud and busy and fast. We come in silence to hear your voice. We come in silence to listen. Sometimes you speak to us very clearly. Sometimes we hear your voice in the voice of another in in a road sign laid out for us in a, in a map that seems to appear to guide us. Sometimes it's not so obvious. Sometimes you speak in dreams. Sometimes you speak in hints and whispers. But always you ask us to listen and look and watch and be ready. Help us, open our ears, open our minds, open our hearts, open our eyes to all the ways you speak to us. Open us to your gentle nudgings. Open us when sometimes you give us a shove. Help us with courage and strength to follow where you lead, to act upon your call, to live as you want us to live in this world. We pray this morning for all those persons whose names we've mentioned out loud or whose names we carry deep in our hearts. Some are struggling mightily this morning with illness or weakness or sadness or loneliness. We ask your comfort and your peace for each one. Some need to be reminded that you are with them. 
because they've lost sight. Help us to remind them. Help us to be your love for them and with them. We also lift those who celebrate today, whether it's a a simple celebration of grandchildren visiting or summer sunshine or cool sleeping nights. Whatever it is we celebrate today, we give you thanks for that blessing and for all the others you shower upon us. All these things we pray as your people loving you and hoping to be yours. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus the Christ as we offer to you the prayer he first taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. Lord of all creation who gives and holds nothing back, bless these gifts that we offer this morning. Help us not just to give, but also to live more boldly and more generously. Grant us the faith to step out of the places in our lives where we are so cautious and anxious that we miss the joy that comes from the kingdom living that Jesus taught. Help us to walk on water, strong in our faith and keeping our eyes on Christ. In his holy name we pray. Amen. Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 14, a familiar passage. As soon as the meal was finished, Jesus insisted that the disciples get in the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the people. With the crowd dispersed, Jesus climbed the mountain so that he could be by himself and pray. He stayed there alone late into the night. Meanwhile, the boat was far out to sea when the wind came up against them and they were battered by the waves. At about four o'clock in the morning, Jesus came walking toward them walking on the water. They were scared out of their wits. A ghost, they said, crying out in terror. But Jesus was quick to comfort them. Courage, he said, it's me. Don't be afraid. Peter, suddenly bold, said, Master, if it's really you, call me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come ahead. But when Peter looked down at the waves churning beneath his feet, he lost his nerve and started to sink. He cried, Master, save me. Jesus didn't hesitate. He reached down and grabbed his hand. And then he said, faint heart, what got into you? The two of them climbed into the boat and the wind died down. The disciples in the boat, having watched the whole thing, Worship Jesus, saying, This is it. You are God's Son for sure. It's a story rich scripture day, isn't it? 
The piece that was missing out of the first scripture, the Joseph story, in case you've already forgotten the first scripture was about Joseph, um, left out the dreams he had, and we'll get to those. But I think it's very true, and always true, that dreamers pay a heavy price. All of human history proves it. Those who dare to step out of others' expectations of them tend to do so at their own risk. Those who dare to conceive a different reality than the one they currently are in get laughed at. They get mocked and marginalized and excluded and crucified. But the dreamers keep on dreaming, God bless them. There's a certain amount of inherent courage in someone who keeps dreaming the dream despite the repercussions. Take Joseph, annoying youngest brother of 11. Some of you have younger brothers, you've already said so. Irritating, yes? I had a younger sister, not quite the same thing. I love her now. Anyway, Joseph, this annoying youngest brother, comes along with these dreams, the little piece left out of the scripture. That's your homework. Go look them up. He comes along with these dreams where sheaves of wheat representing his brothers all bow down to his sheaf of wheat. And another dream where the sun and the moon and the stars all bow down to him. Now, can you imagine your younger brother coming to you with something like that? Strange dreams about better times, better places, when he, annoying youngest brother, is in charge. Now, if you're going to have dreams about being in authority over someone who is currently in authority of some kind over you, I would say the best course of action is not to march up to that person and tell him your dream, much less to 11 somebodies who are all bigger and older than you who are already mad because daddy likes you best, because you tattle on them. Joseph is not only a dreamer, he also seems not to be the sharpest tool in the shed in this story. But he continues to dream his dreams, which is not his fault. And he tells his dreams, which is his fault. And he reaps the consequences of both. He comes close to getting murdered by his brothers and he's reprieved only by his sale into slavery, some reprieve. Those who dare to dream a different reality will be checked by those who are not ready to change, whether from fear or habit or peer pressure or whatever. If you want to go back farther into the Hebrews story, sacred story, take the story of Moses. Moses, you know his story, he was raised by the Pharaoh's family, he goes into exile, he dreams a dream about God and about salvation and about redemption from slavery, and he goes back into Egypt to carry out that dream. He struggles mightily to get them out. It's a fabulous story, Exodus. He struggles and he works and he frets and he prays to get them out of slavery, and what do they do? They form what many clergy call a back to Egypt committee. It tells Moses that no matter what this promised land looks like, no matter how much milk and honey and freedom it promises to them, his dream is crazy and they need to stop now and go back to what they know. The back to Egypt committee. Those who dare to imagine a different world will most often be checked by those closest to them. It seems to be an immutable truth. Even Jesus was not exempt. He emerges into history with a vastly different interpretation of who God is and what God wants and who we are in relation to God. Vastly different ideas about that than his religion offered. And the Back to Egypt Committee resurfaces in the form of the Pharisees and the scribes who tell him, be quiet, stop. Stop healing, stop preaching, stop doing what you're doing, and we will, or, you know, or we will kill you. And ultimately, they did. We can name centuries of persons since who have been bold enough to speak their dreams out loud into the universe, 
and who've been killed for their courage. You know who they are. That dream catcher I was showing to the kids this morning, that peace there, there's something important there, I think, about letting the good dreams, the vital dreams fly loose into the world. The bad dreams can get stuck. That's fine. They need to be. But God creates the good dreams, and all the other forces of the world and ourselves create the bad dreams. They need to be stopped. But God's dreams need to fly. The people of God are called to be dreamers, dream weavers, dream builders, to dream impossible things. Because actually, God says nothing is impossible. We're called to let God's dreams live in the world. Too often, way too often, the people of God in the church and elsewhere end up trying to catch all the dreams and not let any of them fly. We cross a line between stopping the harmful ideas and being gatekeepers of all the dreams. We set the filters too high and we decide that all dreams are dangerous, either because we can't control them or we can't see their outcome or because we can't understand them or we have some notion of protecting either ourselves or others from something. But every now and then, every now and then, someone will let the dream into his or her heart and they will fly with it. They catch a glimpse of the reality that the dream promises. They see what the dreamer means and they begin to dream the dream for themselves. Take Peter in this story from Matthew's Gospel. Peter, for a moment, gets it. He gets who Jesus is. Before this moment, and certainly after this moment, he has his doubts, but for this moment, in the middle of a storm, and with Jesus calling him forward, he gets it. He gets that Jesus is about something so different that the world itself can change. Storms can still, people can walk on water. Faith can carry someone where logic can't. Now, I don't think for a minute that the rest of the folks in the boat were quiet as this was happening. I'm guessing there were a couple of Back to Egypt committee members in there. Don't go, Peter, don't do it. Don't step out, you'll drown. Not worth it, don't try. Are you crazy? You'll drown, that's the lake out there. You know the type. Maybe you are the type, I don't know. Some people call it caution. Others call it control. But a friend of mine, Michael Piazza, says this, you may be right, and Jesus may be wrong, but he's the one you've chosen to follow. I heard once about a church that decided it needed to give more permission and have less control over the ideas that God was giving its members for ministry. Imagine that. They put little jars out all over the church. And when anyone found themselves putting a roadblock in someone's way by saying something like, well, you have to take it to this committee and this committee and this committee, or you have to get permission from the church council to do this, or we just can't do that, or worst of all, we've never done it that way before. That's the seven last words of the church, by the way. Whenever someone said such a thing, they were to put $20 in one of those little jars. They called it the lab fund for future ministry. They raised $5,000. <laughs> and they got the point. They got it. God still sends dreams. 
Dreams for the way the world can and should be. Little dreams and big dreams and every size dream in between. And there are still dreamers out there. And yes, some of them are actually in our churches. And every now and then, every now and then, we get it. We let the dreams fly. We may not know what they look like when we first encounter them, but we need to learn to recognize them and fly with them. Because without those dreams, without those God moments of getting it, God cannot speak. And we will not be the people God has created us to be, and the world cannot change. Dreamers pay a heavy price, but that's who God calls us to be. Andrew Lloyd Webber gives Joseph these last words. The world and I, we are still waiting, still hesitating. Any dream will do. When God sends the dream, we need to get it. And that's good news. Thanks be to God. Amen. Should we sing together? <laughs>